Welcome to this video from the Taster Day for the MA in Data Journalism at Birmingham City University and also the PG Cert, the Postgraduate Certificate in Data Journalism, which is a shorter part-time version of the Masters in Data Journalism. In this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, data journalism, um, where you find data-driven stories, uh, and in some subsequent videos, we'll talk about skills to get stories out of data and what to do next if you want to continue to look at this. Firstly, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Paul Bradshaw. I am the course leader for the MA in Data Journalism at Birmingham City University. And um, I um, do a number of things. I, um, as well as working at the, uh, at the university, I work as a data journalist with the BBC England Data Unit. I um, train journalists at a number of organisations and I've written a number of books about data journalism and about online journalism more generally. And you can read my um, uh, blogging about online journalism on the online journalism blog. So first a little bit about um, what I mean by data journalism. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to write an introduction to um, the Data Journalism Handbook. And as part of that, I really tried to um, come up with as succinct a definition as possible of what we mean when, we, when I certainly talk about data journalism. And um, what I came up with was this idea that um, data can be the source of data journalism or it can be the tool with which the story is told so interactivity for example is a form of data journalism and quite often it's both like any source it should be treated with skepticism just because it's data doesn't mean it's true or factual and like any tool we should be conscious of how data journalism can shape and restrict the stories that are created with it so if we automatically reach for visualisation, what does that do in terms of our journalism and the stories that we tell? Likewise, a, a few years before that, I created what I called the inverted pyramid of data journalism as a, a way of trying to map really just how many different dimensions there are to data journalism. Because um, it's not just about visualisation. There are many other ways that you can tell a story. You can make it human, which is often done in broadcast media. Um, you can personalise it. You can make it interactivity. You can make tools out of it. Um, you can make it social. Or you can just write text stories. You can narrate a story that might not have any numbers at all. And in order to get that story... You might need to compile it in different ways. That might be anything from the use of freedom of information requests to scraping to um, using sources. You will probably have to clean it. You might have to combine it to get it into context. So there are lots of different skills and stages involved in data journalism and a lot of different things that you can learn um, and different things that we teach on the course. Data journalism is certainly being used more and more widely in the industry. Um, this is um, from some research by Google in 2017 asking journalists how often they use data and how often they use quotes. And it was quite striking um, just how many journalists use data two or more times a week. Um, 42%. What's also striking is how few use quotes just as much. Um, but as with any data, I think you should be quite sceptical about these statistics and you should bear in mind um, who has collected this, which is Google, and they have a vested interest in um, making this figure as big as possible, and how that data was collected. Also, um, another important factor in the rise of data journalism has been um, the increase in fact-checking as a genre of journalism. This uh, chart on the left is from some research into um, the number of fact-checking sites around the world. And um, it really has shot up in the last few years. The, the map on the right is, is uh, where those are in the world. And this includes dedicated fact-checking sites like Full Fact in the UK, uh, but it also includes full facting, uh, full sorry, fact checking being increasingly integrated into 
um, normal journalism if you like so um, election coverage will have fact checking built in and of course um, employers media organizations are investing heavily in data not however that this also includes um, data in the form of analytics and uh, internal data at the BBC they have explicitly set out to um, make data journalism as they put it a cornerstone of its reporting in all areas of news coverage in addition to their visual journalism unit based in London they have established the BBC England data unit um, based in Birmingham just down the road from um, here and the shared data unit which works with um, media organizations right across the country regional news organizations including JPI and NewsQuest have set up data journalism units in the last year um, it really is a, a growing area and you can see it um, right across the industry not just in print or in broadcast um, or magazines and part of the reason for this is because data journalism tends to be quite successful in attracting and keeping readers many of the most viewed stories of the year tend to be interactives or data-driven investigations um, interactivity means that people often spend longer on a page even basic visualization can lead to a longer amount of time being spent reading an article so so in pure commercial terms data journalism has a lot of um, arguments in its favor but also obviously it offers the opportunity for journalism to compete more with blogging and and um, if you like more amateur forms of journalism um, and it uh, allows journalism to be more investigative to be more exclusive to, to set itself apart and as I said you can see it in print news organizations you can see it in broadcast in TV and you can see it uh, you can hear it on the radio and there's, there are lots of examples in these slides that you can explore and just to give you one example of, of how multi-platform this can be this this is a particular story which some of these students on the MA in data journalism at Birmingham City University worked on last year um, ITV News approached us uh, because they had 10,000 rows of data from a survey that they had conducted with head teachers at schools in the UK um, and they um, wanted us to help pull out the, the key themes in those responses. It was quite a, a tricky challenge because this was mainly text data, it wasn't numbers um, and the students worked together, broke apart the, the, the tasks and, and uh, looked at different questions and pulled out the kind of top lines um, of the um, data. And the story went live um, uh, the, the following week. It went uh, on the TV in the uh, evening bulletin and lunchtime bulletins. So we were able to watch how that story was told for TV. But also it was told on the website, so on the left there you have the article version of it, the text version with some embedded video. It went on Twitter, which is the middle version there with a, another piece of video. And it went on Facebook, which is the example on the right. And in each of those tellings of that story, the three there online, on social and also on TV, um, different editorial choices are made. And it's a good example of how the same story might be told in different ways depending on the platform. So let's start with where data journalism stories come from. Well, you might look at some data like this um, and you might say, well, that is a useful source for a piece of data journalism. This is gender pay gap data. Uh, each row shows a different organization and the difference in pay between men and women, among other things. And you might write an article like this. But equally, you might look at something like this. This is a film script, and you might see that as data. And indeed, that's what someone did when they put together this piece of data journalism. This is an analysis of um, directions in film scripts that start with she or he. And what that data journalism um, identifies is there's a clear gender difference in the sorts of directions that are given to female characters and actors 
and the sorts of directions given to uh, male counterparts. So text can be data as well. You might watch President Obama's inauguration speech and realise that that's data as well. This is a um, couple of word clouds that were generated, the top one from Obama's inauguration speech and the uh, one underneath is from George W. Bush's second inauguration speech. And those word clouds allowed you to tease out the themes in those very long speeches. So in um, a matter of seconds, you can see the very different themes that those two presidents are focused on, the sorts of language that they're using. Equally, you might look at something like this and see that as data, because it is. Anything that's digitised, that's turned into online images or sound or video, is quantifiable. So you might do a story like this, looking at which colours um, occur most often. Likewise, you might look at a web page like this, some sheet music, and you might notice that on the bottom right there are some details about each piece of sheet music that uh, includes, for example, the lowest and highest notes. So you might aggregate those and do a story like this, looking at if you take each singer and all of their sheet music in aggregate, what are their lowest and highest notes and who has the biggest vocal range. Finally, you might look at a book. So again, text. Um, and yes, you might again see that as data. So you might look at where words occur in a particular plot. But you might, so, might also look at relationships that that text encodes. This is a network analysis of one of the Game of Thrones books. And what it does is it treats any sentence that contains two characters as a relationship between, between those characters, an interaction between those characters. So that relationship is one row in the data and using data shapes in that way, you can generate a visualization showing which characters are more closely related to each other. In other words, which ones have the most interactions with each other or appear together in sentences and which ones are further apart. So there are lots of different um, ways to see data and lots of different stories to tell with that. And one of the key skills in data journalism is to be able to see data, not just in spreadsheets, but everywhere, because as soon as it's digitized, it becomes data. And typically there are two types of stories that we are going to write about as data journalists. We're either going to be reacting quickly to some new data that has been released in some way, or we're going to be coming up with our own ideas and more proactively looking for stories, probably taking more time. When it comes to reactive stories, I'd say there are broadly five um, key types of stories you might want to look for. The top one is obviously, you know, who's top and who's bottom. If uh, some data is released on political donations, for example, who's getting the most money, who's getting the least. If data is released on crime, which crime, uh, what's the most common crime, what's the least common. Equally, the second uh, type of story you might tell is about change. So which type of crime is going up or has shot up unusually or is higher than you might expect. You might also look at a story about whether things are working or not. When unemployment data comes out, the story that we are telling as journalists normally is whether government policy is working. Um, so in other words, if unemployment is down, then the government is working, its policy is working, assuming um, that it does not want unemployment to rise. Um, if unemployment is rising, then government policy is not working. That's the, the implication. And indeed, our story might look for some uh, interviews to do with people who might criticise the rise in unemployment. Trend stories might look at, at broader uh, trends. So we might look at, um, say we're looking at political donations again, we might look at, well, there's been a, an increase in smaller donations. That's, that's a growing trend in that sector. And failing all of that, we might simply look for a story about a striking statistic. What's the big percentage of a big amount of money that's being spent? Proactive stories, on the other hand, 
our stories were we have an idea, um, we might be the only person who gets access to some data and we have more time to work on that idea or that data than would be the case if we were reacting quickly to a deadline. So our typical proactive stories tend to be longer, tend to be deeper, and a good example would be a state of a nation story. So in other words, you take an issue, say migration, and you find the figures around that issue and you tell a story about this is the state of migration in the world right now. These are the countries um, experiencing the highest rates or the lowest rates of migration. You might tell a story about differences between different areas of a country or indeed different areas of the world. So, for example, I worked on a story um, about uh, fertility treatment and in different parts of the UK you are entitled to different, um, a different amount of fertility treatment. So you're able to tell a story about the differences between the north and south of the country, for example. You might take a claim that a politician is making or a celebrity or a sports person or a pundit and you might test if that claim is true. Um, this can be a political claim, so someone saying that crime went down when they were mayor of London, for example. Um, or you might it might be a, a much uh, less serious claim. Someone is claiming that a particular football player is not fit. Um, so you might look at how many miles that player runs compared to other players. Another thing that people often look for is things happening together and this is where I would generally recommend a degree of caution as a journalist. Um, so if, for example, crime is going up and the numbers of police are going down, that doesn't necessarily mean that one thing is causing the other. And it, you might not even be able to tell which way the relationship is going. So, for example, are you going to say that police numbers are down because crime is down and so the, the government... Uh, thinks that we don't need as many police or are you going to argue that crime is uh, sorry crime has gone up uh, because there are fewer people to uh, act as a deterrent um, you um, need to realize that it's very difficult to prove causation there's a difference between two things happening together and one thing causing the other um, and social scientists struggle to establish this and often cannot establish this themselves. So we as journalists, without having control over the collection of the data, um, are gonna struggle even more. So uh, if that's the sort of story you're looking at, um, as I said, I would be very careful about that. And also um, you're probably likely to need an expert to, um, to interview and to act as, as one of the key aspects of your story. And indeed, your story might be more about what the expert says than about what the data says. Um, or indeed, you might uh, want to look at the data to check what the expert is saying. The final proactive story is where there's some sort of problem with the data. Often, uh, people initially worry that this means they don't have a story. But if there is a problem with the data or you can't get hold of the data, then this might well be a story itself. If... Uh, the data is not collected or someone says that they uh, are not willing to give it to you, then there might be a story about a lack of accountability. Likewise, if the uh, data is flawed, you realise that it's, it's just wrong and people tell you that they know it's wrong um, or it's manipulated, then there might be a story about the quality of the data as well. So I'm going to stop there in terms of introducing um, data journalism and in a second video I'll move on to working with some data itself.